Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. Stay with us now. And the day is almost over. This side will be group one, this side will be group two. Group one can follow David, group two can follow me. Before you, 
the lifting up of my hands as an offering to you. Keep watch within me, Lord. Deep in my heart, may the watch within me, Lord. Mm. Shine bright. Let my prayer rise up like incense before you. The lifting up of my hands as an offering to you. All praise to the God of all, Creator of life. All praise be to Christ and the Spirit of love. Let my prayer rise up like incense before you, the lifting up of my hands as an offering to you. invite you to stand as you are able for a hearing of the gospel according to Matthew, the 27th chapter. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Je Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Jesus Barabbas, or Jesus who is called the Messiah. For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? All of them said, Let him be crucified. Then he asked, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was a great beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His blood be upon us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him, him over to be crucified. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. So each week during these midweek worship services, we've been looking at the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in chronological order, to hear their various portraits, their distinct confessions of faith, that they were written to emphasize the meaning of Jesus' life and written for particular communities of faith. And these communities had particular concerns and setbacks. And so far we've looked at the Gospels of Mark, and of Luke. But today we're going to dig into Matthew. The Gospel according to Matthew is the story of a king. Matthew is more like Mark than Luke, than Matthew is like Luke. Matthew portrays Jesus' suffering and humanity. However, Matthew is concerned with demonstrating that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke are commonly called the synoptic Gospels, from the Greek word synoptikos, and it means seeing it all together. And, and it's because they, have, they tell a similar story, um, and their viewpoint, their content, their narrative flow, and style are, are very similar. So they're the synoptic Gospels. 
By the time Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John um, are also called the evangelists were written, the Gospels, uh, the communities they were written to, these early Christian communities, were made up of both Jews and Gentiles, otherwise known as non-Jewish people. Matthew's community was primarily Jewish. So he focused on showing how Jesus fulfilled the Jewish prophecies about the Messiah. In the early decades of Christianity, a person who called themselves Christian, as opposed to Jewish, wasn't as different as today. Jesus is Jewish. His disciples were Jewish. Most of the first folks who believed in Christianity were Jewish. It changed when the Apostle Paul got on the scene, and he took the gospel to the Gentiles. And soon there were all kinds of Christians— there were Jewish Christians, there were Greek Christians, there were Roman Christians, there were African Christians. But early on, Christians didn't see themselves as different from Jewish, but instead as Jews who believed that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. And most likely, this is the audience hearing Matthew's Gospel. So throughout Matthew's Gospel, you hear references to Moses and images from Moses' time. For instance, Jesus gives his famous Sermon on the Mount, on a mountain, which reminds people of Moses and how he talked to the people on Mount Horeb. Whereas Luke, on the other hand, has the same story, but it's on an open plain. Matthew breaks down Jesus' teachings into five parts, just like the books of the law accredited to Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Matthew also points out that what happens to Jesus falls in line with Jewish prophecies about the Messiah. Look at the story of Gethsemane. That's the one that we looked at last week with Luke. Only it was the Mount of Olives. Twice, Jesus points out what is happening is intended to fill the scriptures. Matthew is writing in a time when there was some controversy among Jewish communities about Jesus, whether or not he was really the Messiah. And it was causing people to take sides. So Matthew doesn't just present evidence and hopes people will believe in Jesus. He goes out of his way to paint his rivals in a bad light. Major religious figures of Judaism fall after the fall of the Jerusalem temple are Pharisees or leaders of the local synagogue. So Pharisees did not believe Jesus is the Messiah. And in Matthew's gospel, the Pharisees are always arguing and debating with Jesus over the interpretation of Jewish scriptures and tradition. For example, Matthew goes out of his way to show that Jesus' death was the fault of Jewish religious authorities. Which leads us to the troubling scene I just read. That of Pontius Pilate, Jesus, and the Jewish people. There is this edge to the book of Matthew. It's like he wants to make sure we realize this isn't Pilate's fault. In the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, when Herod and the chief priests want to kill Jesus, the Magi, or wise men who weren't Jewish, intervene and warn Joseph to run away and hide the baby Jesus. And now another Gentile, Pilate's wife, is having a dream warning Pilate not to cooperate with the chief priests and Jewish elders. So Pilate says he wants nothing to do with punishing Jesus. But Mark and Luke also, as well as Matthew, tell about the request to free Barabbas. No one else says that Pilate washed his hands of Jesus' death and has the crowds cry that they accept full responsibility for everything. And it's really tough for us to read this today, knowing the history that we know. 
and understands such harsh and shocking statements like his blood be on us and our children. Matthew wrote something like that when his community was in the minority and had a rivalry with their neighbors who were Jewish. But sadly, throughout the centuries, these words of rivalry have done tremendous damage. In some time periods, Christians used this blood oath as an excuse to beat up Jewish people during Holy Week. Quotes from Matthew and John were used to support the extermination of all Jews during Hitler's reign. When we read both the books of Matthew and John, which we'll talk about next week, we need to explain, contextualize, and explain to others the original setting of these Gospels, how the community Matthew addressed was a minority who felt persecuted, that eventually Christians became the majority. They held the power of Western society. We have to be cautious not to let Matthew's accusing tone guide our words and actions. You see, scripture is powerful. And Christians have used it for good and for evil over the centuries. There are many things in the Bible that were written in one context, and because they are written that way and found in the Bible, they're used to hurt and destroy and exclude children of God from the community of God to this day. So here, in the dark side of Matthew, is still the light of the gospel. It is important that we not only point out why Matthew is writing the way he did, but also to point the larger picture of Jesus in order to stand against prejudice. To do that, we have to look at Matthew's story of resurrection. Matthew follows Mark's outline, as did Luke. But Matthew's story is much more dramatic with an earthquake and flashing angel, a cover-up story involving the chief priests, part of an ongoing rivalry we talked about, and an appearance from Jesus where he commissions the disciples to take the gospel into all the world. In Matthew's view, God has not forsaken Jesus, and that becomes obvious immediately after his death. All three synoptic Gospels know of the tearing of the temple curtain, but only Matthew reports an earthquake where rocks are split and tombs are open and the dead rise. Peculiar to Matthew is the aftermath of the burial. The chief priests and Pharisees get permission from Pilate to post a guard at the tomb. The intention was to frustrate attempts at making Jesus' prediction that he would rise on the third day but they turned out to be the witnesses of the resurrection. None of the other evangelists show any awareness that the women coming to the tomb would be facing armed guards. This is told in an environment of great debate over the claim that Jesus is the Messiah. Matthew is saying people can do all they want to make certain Jesus is dead and gone. You can even seal and guard his tomb. Nevertheless, the Lord who shook the earth when Jesus died will shake it again. The guards will fall in fear. The tomb will be opened and be a witness that God is faithful, powerful, keeps the promise made in the Son and that Jesus is with such power. So we've got Mark, we've got Matthew, using similar terms to show how human Jesus was and how very real his suffering. But where Mark leaves things open-ended, Matthew ties things up so that we'll know the God who acted in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures is again at work, and this time through Jesus. Amen.
peace of the Lord be with you always. Take this time to share the peace and then we will have offering. Merciful God, we pray out for the hope and healing you offer. Guide us continually to your service. Make us your hands to feed the hungry and prepare us to receive the bread of life. Create your Son, our Savior. Amen.
Great and merciful God, source and ground of all goodness and life, give to your people the peace that passes all understanding and the will to live your gospel of mercy and justice. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name.